Welcome back to the People's Basics for another episode of the People's Platform, where we talk to members of the community like you about your top passion issues, as well as a variety of ways of how we can accomplish these goals. With us today, we're going to be talking to Max Guinness, who works at the UBI Center, as well as on an application called the Policy Engine, which is an application to try and get everyone to become policymakers themselves. Uh, so we wanted to talk to him about those projects, as well as a variety of policy issues, specifically UBI, a big issue that we advocate here at the People's Basics. Before we get into that interview, we want to remind you all to make sure that you are subscribed to our channel so that you're notified about all future content that we come out with by making sure that you hit that bell as well. As well, hit that like so that more people will see us in the algorithm and check out the description section by clicking our link tree to get all of our links and join our community. Without further ado, let's bring on Max Gennis. Max, welcome to the People's Platform. Good to be here, John. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be able to have you, Max. I love the work that you're currently doing, and I really wanted to talk to you first about that before we get into any policy discussions. Uh, you have dedicated yourself in two ways so far, primarily towards advancing causes around basic income and just citizen activation around politics. I wanted you to be able to tell the folks out there a little bit more about your work at first of all, the UBI Center, uh, and then we'll talk about the policy engine. But can you tell me what you guys currently do at the UBI Center to help the UBI cause? Yeah. Um, so we are a think tank that is solely dedicated to researching UBI policies. And what that means for us, we actually started a couple of years ago, um, brought on some researchers from the US and the UK and what we largely do is simulate different UBI policies. So the first one we did was Andrew Yang's Freedom Dividend, probably still the most well-known UBI policy out there. So to answer questions like who comes out ahead and behind, how does it affect the poverty rate? What's the overall cost? How does it affect inequality? Um, and then kind of taking that quantitative angle to answer a bunch of other questions around UBI. So we've done reports on, for example, how does it affect indigenous Americans or the gender gap in poverty? Or we've done something recently on how was the research say in terms of child tax credits and fertility? So will that change the, the birth rate and things like that? Uh, we've done a report recently on carbon dividends as well. So having a carbon tax that funds uh, UBI. And that's been on the US side. On the UK side, we actually built um, a micro simulation model, the first open source model that simulates the entire tax and benefit system and use that to produce a number of reports on UBI in the UK. Actually, there's quite a bit of support for UBI in the UK, especially relative to the US. So that's been a really exciting area for us to get into. And um, we can probably, we'll talk about this a bit later, but part of that has been building a front end for that micro simulation model, which we ended up calling Policy Engine. And that basically incubated within UBI Center. And now it's actually a separate organization dedicated to, as you said, kind of making everyone a policymaker by letting anyone reform the tax and benefit system and see the impact on both society and their household. So to answer your question quickly, like we're kind of the nerds of the UBI movement. I That's how I see it ourselves. Well, I have to say the nerds are a very essential part. And I'd love to ask you how you kind of go about doing those simulations. Like, obviously, there are going to be assumptions that need to be uh, put into play and certain factors around these policies that we have to make certain degrees of assumptions of how they're being built or filled in certain stopgap wise and certain rates holding consistent. Is there any process that you guys go about with? Let's give, for example, Andrew Yang's uh, universal basic income proposal. How did you go about trying to evaluate who is helped in those scenarios? Yeah, most of our research does what's called static modeling. So we assume that there isn't behavioral change. We've also worked with some um, experts on developing more dynamic macroeconomic models. So if you have a policy that's gonna change the deficit or change tax rates, both of those are probably going to reduce, um, potentially they could reduce economic activity by reducing the payoff to extra work. Um, but what we've done so far kind of is actually pretty common in think tanks and academic research when scoring these kind of policies is just very simple. Who are you giving money to? Who are you taking money away from through the tax and benefit system? Um, so as you said, with the freedom dividend, the 
biggest chunk of change that funded that was the VAT, value added tax. And that raised about two thirds of the total revenue from the Freedom Dividend. And what we did is we actually consulted a report from the Tax Policy Center, which is one of the most, um, one of the biggest think tanks that does this kind of tax modeling research out there. And they basically said for every part of the income distribution, how a VAT would affect their after-tax income on average. Um, we did something similar with the carbon tax piece of the Freedom Dividend and the financial transactions tax piece. And then there were some pieces we could model ourselves because we sort of have it in the what's called a micro simulation model. So what micro simulation model does is it looks at every, you have a representative survey. So in the US, the most common um, version of that survey is called the current population survey. So that has a few tens of thousands of records. Um, and those are each households. And you basically say for each of those households, how is this policy going to affect them based on their income and the benefits that they receive? And then you sort of take an average or a, a sum of those, you do a weighted sum, and that gets you the total um, impact on society. So that kind of approach we were able to do for the benefit side. Um, one of the more controversial parts of the Freedom Dividend was it only gave you money um, if you chose to forego other benefits like food stamps and SSI. Um, so we were able to basically model that decision that individuals were making in terms of whether to participate in the program or not. Um, and similarly with the tax system, there were um, changes to the capital gains rates, to payroll tax rates. We were able to basically do that directly. And in the future, we're actually trying to build policy engine US. Um, and we were able to do this on the UK side. We want to be able to do that kind of record by record analysis for every single um, policy that's out there to the extent possible. And this involves some data science work. My background is actually in, in tech as a data scientist. So there's a lot of like ground, um, ground level research we need to do to make that happen. But I think that's really powerful because you can then use the same data to say, this is gonna affect the poverty rate in this way, the budget in this way, the number of people who come out ahead and behind it this way. And you can really automate that to make it a product once you do it in everything in the same uh, vein. So Max, I wanted to ask you from these various studies, have you found any consistent trends in, you know, beneficial program design? Uh, obviously you made reference that some aspects of the freedom debt dividend were deemed controversial, uh, like the mention of some of the welfare benefits being opt in or out. Uh, have you found any trends in design of program that have shown more beneficial results uh, from these modelings? I think something that's kind of underappreciated is just how progressive giving money as a UBI is if you fund it by even the flat tax. So I think we saw this with the VAT. Um, a VAT is sometimes criticized as being regressive. It is slightly regressive, but when you pair it with a UBI, it's it really reduces poverty and inequality dramatically. And actually this is the approach that other countries have taken. Countries in the EU and the Nordics that raise more revenue and uh, have lower inequality. They basically have their government reduce inequality more through two things. They have very broad based taxation. So they actually have less progressive taxation in terms of the folks at the top pay a similar rate at folks at the bottom compared to the US where um, even though they the rates are relatively low, folks at the top do pay a higher rate than folks at the bottom uh, in general. So they do that to raise a whole bunch of revenue and then they have very broad based taxes. So, oh, sorry, broad based benefits as well. Um, things like child benefits that are mostly universal and um, other kinds of pensions and other benefits. They're just able to raise more revenue and distribute that more. And that's a more effective approach than um, what the US does. So I think that's what we've seen through, we actually have study of a flat tax, a flat income tax. This is kind of a third rail and policy design. Yeah. Um, but surprisingly, if you just had 25% flat income tax in the US, replacing all other, other taxes, um, and you redistribute that surplus as a UBI, that is now reducing inequality compared to the status quo. So I think people would not expect that if you took the whole progressive tax system, and we're not even touching the benefits here, but take that whole progressive tax system, turn it into a flat tax, 
and just the power of giving everybody money because there are a lot of people at the bottom who really get very little. You're able to reduce poverty and inequality. Um, yeah, I, I think that's kind of an underappreciated piece. And then to the benefit side also, I think people generally overestimate how generous these benefits are. So Andrew Yang's freedom dividend, the fact that he, um, he did require that choice barely affected anybody. There's like very few households that get a thousand bucks per adult uh, every month. And um, so by far the, actually the biggest piece that did limit the in positive impact of Andrew Yang's freedom dividend is the fact that it completely excluded um, non-citizens and also it gave zero to kids. So yeah, I think those are kind of three of the biggest takeaways we've seen is one, just having raising a lot of revenue makes a big difference and broad-based taxation, um, even though it's not very progressive on itself, it produces progressive outcomes with UBI. Two, I think you really do want to include at least in some way, non-citizens. Um, and three, you really want to give some amount to kids if you want to reduce poverty cost effectively. Yeah, so I'd love to ask you a little bit more behind some of those secondary conclusions you were talking about before about certain participants being included. Um, obviously, you are going to be making some of the case of the progressive benefit of benefiting undocumented immigrants being, again, undocumented immigrants are going to be, on average, a poorer population than the general American population. Is that the main way you're concluding, like, in your definition of better like what outcomes have you been kind of looking for and measure? Is it just net uh, income distribution? Uh, what, a, what measurements do you use when trying to evaluate uh, program design? Yeah, well, to be clear, uh, I think there are three categories, right? You've got citizens, legal permanent residents who are not citizens and then undocumented immigrants. Um, and so the way you can um, assess these we actually have a tool called the Basic Income Builder. So that's bib.ubicenter.org. And that lets you say, okay, we're gonna raise a certain amount of revenue from some sort of tax reform or benefit reform. And we can distribute that to just adults, just citizens, and um, or just everyone. And it will tell you, given that fixed pot of revenue, how much are you reducing poverty? How much are you reducing child poverty? Uh, deep poverty as well is in there. So that's what you can maximize the impact of by distributing it more broadly. Um, for a fixed amount of revenue, in general, you're going to have stronger anti-poverty impacts if you give it equally to everyone. Okay, that makes a lot of sense to me. And there's one other policy that I wanted to ask you about. So there's not a lot of basic income policy when it comes to the U.S. Congress currently. The main bill that has a bill that's intending to do it in perpetuity is the Support Act. I know the UBI Center has done some evaluation on the Support Act. Do you care to comment on some of your findings when evaluating that piece of legislation, whether you think it's a good basic income proposal? Yeah, well, so the Support Act, um, let's see, I'll have to refresh my memory a bit, but I know one of the important pieces of it is that it doesn't take effect until 2028. Um, I think we can do something more quickly than that. So it sets aside some revenue. It's basically two programs in one. It's a certain amount of revenue that um, will fund basic income pilots until 2028. And then starting in 2028 will be the actual um, guaranteed income tax credit. And this is pretty darn close to a UBI. So it is not full UBI. It does phase out with income, but it starts phasing out relatively at relatively high income. And I think it only phases out at 5%. So once you're above that amount, you pay back or you lose um, five cents on every dollar of marginal earnings. So I think that's a pretty good design that sort of mimics what Mitt Romney did with his child um, allowance proposal called the Family Security Act. Because what we're seeing with the child tax credit today is I think really illustrative here. We're having a lot of difficulty reaching the low income families because it's so heavily means tested um, and because even families who might be eligible could be reluctant to participate because if their income changes throughout the year, because the, the amount that you get is based on your income last year, if your income rose this year, which this is a lot, I mean, it's not a perfect economic year, but it's a lot better than yeah. 2020 was. Um, 
you're going to have to pay some of that back. And you don't really know how much that's going to be. Um, and people just surprise bills at tax time are really unpleasant. So yeah, I think the guaranteed income tax credit in terms of the trans the model of the transfer, um, I think you're gonna have higher sec success rates if you just do it through the social security administration instead of through the tax code. But overall, the lack of means testing is quite um, likely to work well and it basically eliminates poverty, I think it, um, yeah, I, I don't remember the exact numbers, but it's quite a strong impact. One thing that does concern me is the fact that it doesn't do anything until 2028 and it has no funding mechanism. So yeah. I think we really do need to start talking about how are we going to pay for it. Um, this program is extremely expensive, multiple trillion, I think four trillion a year or so. Um, so that's part of why we're building Policy Engine is to have more insight into various funding mechanisms like VAT, like flat income taxes, like benefit reform, um, because the reality is we're, we're not going to have a UBI that's, uh, in my view, I think it's very unlikely that we would deficit fund a $4 trillion. Yeah, I, I think that's reasonable conclusion. Maybe a partial deficit funding, but uh, that size is not going to occur. Um, but I wanted to ask you, I alluded to this earlier, the second part of work that you are doing that you said came out of the UBI Senator is the Policy Engine app. Could you elaborate a little bit more about what that app tries to do to make people able to be policy designers themselves? Yeah, so if you go to policyengine.org, you can try this out yourself. Um, it'll be more meaningful to those of you who live in the UK. But we do, we're working on bringing it to the US. We're especially hoping we can bring this to the US in time for the 2022 midterms. But what you'll see there is there's a range of policy parameters you can adjust. And these are set to what the existing, existing policy is in the UK. So you can modify the payroll tax rates, income tax rates, uh, as well as parameters around the benefits. So universal credit is their main benefit, but there are some other benefits in there too. Um, and we've also added uh, some UBI parameters as well as a land value tax. So between all of those parameters, you can design your entire policy, or you can, um, what we really hope to do is empower organizations, uh, campaigns, political parties to design their own policies as well. And then you can share that with the public. So imagine, for example, um, Elizabeth Warren is putting out a new policy proposal in 2022 she could release that to the world through Policy Engine, show them what the impact is on society. So all the things we've been discussing today, the budgetary impact, the impact on the poverty rate, who comes out ahead and behind, that is just right at your fingertips tips with, a, with a link. And then you can go into our household calculator and for that particular policy, you can also say, this is how it's going to affect my own household. So you say, here's how many people I have in the household, their ages, um, and then also the income that you have. And it'll tell you not only how it affects you today, but also, for example, your marginal tax rate. So how is it going to affect how much of a payoff you get for that marginal dollar of earnings? If you get a raise, how's that going to affect you under the baseline policy and as well as the, uh, the new policy reform? So our goal is really to democratize policymaking. Our, our motto is to make everyone a policymaker. And we think having this layer we actually, we want to build a mobile app. So it's as simple as any other app on your phone to design a policy, to revise a policy. So let's say you kind of like that Elizabeth Warren policy, but you want to change some parameter of it. You can basically make a copy and revise it yourself, throw that into a feed so people can vote on different policies, uh, comment on them. And we're all having the same data driven discussion. Uh, so it's not just you're putting out verbal description. We all have numbers that we can look at to see what is the trade-off between having uh, policies affect, maybe if you're on the richer side, you might want policies that affect you more favorably, but that's going to have a smaller poverty impact, um, be worse for inequality. So I think those kind of discussions kind of lack nuance in terms of data today, and we want to change that. Well, I think it's a great idea, and I look forward to seeing when you come out with it more for the U.S., because I would love to start playing around with it and designing some stuff and seeing how it alters it more real time, being able to do projections. So 
Uh, Max, when you come back with that, I'd love to talk to you more on that. But, you know, the last subject I wanted to talk with you about today, Max, is I wanted to talk where the support is for universal basic income and what people can do right now to be more supportive of the universal basic income cause. Could you kind of key us in on who some of those groups are right now where universal basic income is most favorable and where you think we should be pushing on this issue? Yeah, we actually just put out a new product. So our two biggest launches in a while just happened in the past couple of weeks. We launched Policy Engine um, a week and a half ago. And earlier this week, we launched the UBI poll tracker. So we're summarizing over 50 polls on the UBI from around the world. Mostly the US and the UK is where that's, this has been polled. Um, and we're showing it not just the overall public opinion, but you can actually drill down into demographics to see how UBI is favorable against by age or by uh, political persuasion, those kinds of factors. So um, I think if you just go to ubicenter.org, it's going to be at the top there um, or polls.ubicenter.org will be the, the direct dashboard link. Some of the trends we've seen there are UBI is much more favorable um, on the left. So um, Democrats, I think, are twice as likely to support it, something like that, as Republicans. Also in the UK, um, liberals are, you know, Labor Party, Lib Dem Party, those are substantially more likely to support UBI than conservatives. Um, and then I think that's pretty much the main result. There are some other findings like it's more favorable among young people than older people. Those are basically just correlates of um, political leaning. So yeah, I, I think we have a lot of work to do to, there are strong, at least theoretical advantages uh, for people who have conservative leanings of UBI, things like it's less um, invasive than the existing welfare state, it's less costly to administer. I think, you know, the not left, not right, but forward, there's definitely some truth to that. But ultimately right now, I, I think if we want to move toward UBI, we can, we have an opportunity to um, really seize the support on the left side of the spectrum. So a couple of policies that really excite me that I think folks can get on board with. Of course, there's been a lot of discussion of the child tax credit. We have a lot of work to do to, it still seems like that is being threatened in terms of, especially the absence of a work requirement. If a work requirement is introduced back into the child tax credit, I think that would be a major defeat for us. Um, of course, the means, the means testing is not great either. And we, I sort of talked about some of the issues there, but you know, work requirements seem to be the the biggest philosophical dividing line here. Um, and even if it's just made temporary, that extension until 2023 or something like that, it's going to be a hard fight to get Republicans on board there. So that's one. Um, of course, UBI pilots are pretty exciting as well. I think the biggest thing that is not getting enough attention on the UBI community um, side, in my opinion, is the idea for a carbon dividend. So having a carbon tax that funds sure. A uh, small UBI. This, unlike some of the other policies like a child tax credit, the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act actually has like 90 co sponsors in the House. They're all Democrats right now. Um, and this would be a true small UBI. It would not be means tested. There would be no work requirement. It would include children as well. And that would, it would be small at first. It would be about 20 bucks a month. Um, but over time, because the carbon price would actually rise, you'd see a carbon dividend rise to about 90 bucks a month per person. And once people start to see that even small check every month, I think it's gonna be very hard to go back from that. Every policy is going to be evaluated in comparison to, hey, I get this check every month. Why can't you just make it like that? Um, every tax break also, like that is money that could go to making that check bigger. Um, so yeah, I've done a little bit of research on this. It's a critical time for it too, because in the reconciliation package, as much as the child tax credit is at risk, um, there is a possibility for a carbon tax, which there is discussion in the Senate that that would include a dividend. Um, so that's a very real opportunity for us that I think we should seize. 
I wholeheartedly agree on the policy front. I will wet blanket a little bit that I think you're going to find some familiar foes to the carbon taxes we're currently facing, as Joe Manchin is a big critic of that in general. But I do wholeheartedly agree with you. And there's not just environmental support, but you have, I think, thousands of economists who have signed on to a letter for the carbon tax and dividend. So this is something that's been modeled forever. Frankly, I think I remember this letter getting signed again back in like the 70s, like back when we were originally talking UBI, the carbon dividend was an idea back then too. Uh, so I wholeheartedly agree with you. Uh, Max, the final question that I have for you before asking for your final thoughts is, I just want to ask how you think people can get involved. Obviously, there's policies we just talked through, but do you think it's coming through advocating specific candidates, getting involved in outside organizations? What do you think people watching this right now who really care about universal basic income can do to help advance the cause most effectively, in your opinion? Yeah, I think income movement is doing a great job in terms of grassroots support. Um, if you want to get involved in the carbon dividend fight, there is a group called Citizens Climate Lobby. Their entire purpose is to advocate for carbon dividends. And, uh, you know, I think you're right that there are foes, but polls find something like two thirds of Americans or 70% of Americans do support um, a fee really on what is corporate pollution. Um, so yeah, I think those are two really important groups. Um, and yeah, the candidate side, I think we're going to get more into that over the coming months, just understanding who's running, who's in the primary process. That's gonna be a big focus for us and on the policy engine side and the UBI center side. Um, so we can start modeling some of those proposals that are coming out. Um, of course, there are ways to support UBI Center and do, if you're interested in doing quantitative research or if you're a, a programmer looking for a side project, please reach out to me. Both the UBI Center and Policy Engine could, could use some help. So. Okay, great. So Max, my final thing, do you have any final thoughts you want to share with the universal people out there? Or as we always ask, do you have any questions that you wanted to ask me as we wrap up today's program? Well, I always like to ask folks what kind of quantitative questions they might have. Feel like uh, I feel like there's a lot of them out there, and if there's anything you think would be most impactful for the for us to research, yeah. I'd love to hear that. So, on the quantitative side of things, I think what I would like to see the most is just kind of we hear so often about how. Um, there are tax breaks that basically allow the wealthy to escape our progressive tax system. And I would love to see a modeling of which are kind of the biggest offenders. Like, what are the things that we said, OK, if we turn off this deduction, this is where we're going to get the most bang for our buck. Uh, not just the, the benefit proposal side, but like some of the deduction side of where our tax code is allowing all these loopholes, I think would be great to model as well. Totally agree. Yeah, that. Um, that's great. And yeah, we will definitely prioritize that. Yeah. Um, Cause it's been like, so far it's like trying to get the net distribution fixed going the other way. And I would love to see kind of the penalization side of some of the existing policy in place. Yeah. And I guess that kind of ties with maybe a parting thought on my end, which is UBI is in part an exciting idea to me because it forces you to think of the entire system. Uh, because it's such an, you know, it is an expensive program. Um, it's a very bold idea, and it forces you to compare everything we have in the tax code. You know, some of those deductions are very favorable, like mortgage interest deduction. A lot of people really support that. Um, but if you start showing them the data of, hey, if you turn that into a UBI, like we're spending tens of billions of dollars on that, that could lift people out of poverty um, in a really significant way. Um, and same thing for all the other deductions. Maybe we need a sort of grand compromise the, the way Andrew Yang sort of described it with lots of different policies together. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of really interesting directions that the UBI policymaking could go. Um, and I hope people just use that as an opportunity to explore the whole economic system we have because there's a lot of good stuff, a lot of not so great stuff. And I think it's pretty interesting overall, so. 
I, I agree, and I'm very glad there are the wonks out there like you that help us get the data to be the advocates out there. It's always great to be able to have some substantiation or at least modeling of our assumptions of what's going to occur. Uh, so, Max, I want to thank you for that work and coming here today to share your thoughts with us. Thank you for having me, John. You're very welcome. Okay, everyone. So that was Max Gennis again from the UBI Center, as well as the Policy Engine app. If you want to find more about them, please, again, check the description section down below and you will find links to their programs and website. Uh, furthermore, we want to thank you all again for watching another episode of the People's Platform. Make sure you've checked out the whole playlist so you could see other community members in the past who have come on and talked and sign up yourself by going to the Linktree link. You will find our Calendly so that you can sign up. We always record on Sundays and try and put out an episode each week. It depends on guest demand like yourself. So please come sign up. Last thing, make sure that you're subscribed for any new content as well as you've liked this video so that more people see it in the algorithm. That being said, thank you again for watching this video at the home of the Universal Basics, the People's Basics. See you all soon. Thank you.